Okay, good, <coughs> good morning everyone. Did you get to sleep this night? Did you see the dramatic news on the Norwegian television last night? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> well, there was big news on Norwegian television last night. I, I guess you watch it every night, don't you, before you go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> we are not going to have the Winter Olympics in 2022 in Oslo. That's the dramatic news for Norwegians. We have decided against it, and I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> well, it's not a catastrophe at all, from my point of view. All right, um, just um, you, as I understand, you have had problems finding a proper date for the exam uh, in this class. So I got a message from, uh, from uh, Professor Broughton, which is very important that you relate to. There are two propositions, and the only solution now seems to be to have the exam on one of two Saturdays in December. Uh, I will put up the dates here. And if you cannot do this, you will have to send an email to Mr. Broughton and you will have to have a proper reason. Not that Saturdays are not the best days, but uh, uh, we are really struggling to, to get this done. So the alternative exam dates now. Okay, so within October 9th, send an email to Mr. Broughton uh, if you have a good reason why one of these dates couldn't work for you. I hope uh, it's possible to, to resolve this, uh, but it's very important that you, you tell us now if one or both of these are problematic. Just immediately, are there how many of you will have problems with one of these dates? It depends on what's a good reason, because we have exams the 11th and the 15th yeah. already. Yeah. So then it will be 11th, 13th, 15th. Yeah. But this is such a composite class, so it's not, it's not yeah. possible to have the optimal setting. No, so, it, so, so it's about what's, the what's possible. Good yeah. Well, you can try to send it to him. I, I, my suspicion is that if if this is the reason about reading days in between, mm -hmm. this is not something that we can solve for people no. who have multiple exams. But that's just my opinion. You, you, you may send an email to, to Professor Broughton about it. And, and you in the back? Yes. Well, is there a collision with exams or is it more private collisions? Um, very much the same thing. OK, all right, OK. So you're free to send emails, and uh, it's not my decision to make. So, all right. Um, <coughs> now, today the subject matter is related to maritime transport. Uh, there will be two lectures related to this. Um, I'm teaching a full module called maritime transport at the master's level in the spring semester. So. You'll just get a small glimpse of, of what we're dealing with there. Uh, in your curriculum, you have a few articles, uh, a book chapter from 
a very thick book called uh, Maritime Economics by Martin Stopford, which is uh, the most relevant bit for the lecture today. And then we also have an article that I've written on, on environmental issues related to, to shipping. So this is what we'll focus on today. Um, we will, uh, in this lecture, focus mainly on technology, structure and characteristics. So it's mainly to get you up to a certain level of knowledge related to how this world of maritime transport works. So it means that we'll have to have a small glip glimpse into uh, both the types of vessels that we use, the types of trades where maritime transport is important, uh, and how the international regulatory regime, the policy regime for shipping, uh, is working. Okay, so focus today on uh, uh, technology a little bit, although this is not a very technical class, we need to know a little bit uh, what we are talking about, technology-wise. Uh, market structure is uh, more of a core subject, uh, where we look at some key developments and trends in different markets. Uh, we will look at competition in these markets uh, a little bit, because this is very much on the political agenda these days um, regarding international shipping. Uh, especially if we are talking container shipping. Container shipping is uh, getting more and more um, <laughs> competitive in the terms that uh, we have very big actors offering global services and there is a growing concern among governments around the world that these big container ship operators are getting too big and too powerful and on top of that they also want to uh, cooperate form alliances, and this has been a big issue internationally over the last years. Then we will look at some of the trade patterns for some of the major commodities traded by, uh, at sea, and also look at the political uh, regimes towards the end. Next lecture on maritime issues will be given by uh, Professor Broughton, but then we'll focus more on the integration with the rest of the supply chains and, uh, and the logistics and uh, focus more on the port side and the integration with land-based modes and so on. Okay, so let's start since it's very early morning we need to get the, the brain cells working. So first uh, collective brainstorming. What is the media image of maritime transport? What is it that springs to mind when you heard it, hear the term shipping or maritime transport? When does maritime transport hit the media? When you see ships on the front of newspapers? Except the time where there is an accident and uh, I don't know. Let's exactly. Say, for example, with oil. Yeah, uh, oil spills. Yeah, there's something broken and everything goes into the water. Exactly. So oil spills, birds full of oil, these dramatic pictures. I think that's right. And this has been a major complaint from the shipping industry. That this is the only time that we get any attention. This is when things go wrong. Can you remember that things have gone wrong recently? Collision between two ships. Okay. Do you remember where? No? Okay. We are talking about oil spills here. There is another type of shipping disasters which also hit the media headlines. And which did hit the media headlines, mm, I think it's almost two years ago now. Especially in Europe. If it's not about oil spills, it's about the loss of human lives. And then uh, we're talking about passenger vessels, cruise vessels. What was the major incident with a cruise vessel? Costa Concordia. Costa Concordia, off the coast of uh, Italy. Um, a big disaster. So 
that's that's true. This is sort of the media image, maybe, and it's a negative one. But the main problem, maybe, from a shipping point of view, is that it rarely hits the headlines in the media. I think it's more a situation with a lack of attention than negative attention, perhaps. And should it have more at attention? Is it important? Is, is the maritime transport industry important to, to you? I think uh, many things I can buy in shops hmm? uh, are delivered by the uh, shipping transport. And uh, I think it should be more, um, yeah, more focused in, in, yeah. Uh, in the media's. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they only show the the problems. They only show if there is an accident mm. or I don't know something happens. I think if you go downtown in small town of Molde, I think you will find that most of the products you can buy in the shops there, they've been on a shipping link. It's Almost everything that we get from Asia, which is pretty much everything these days, seems, has been on a shipping link. Most of it. The only alternative would be air transport. And what kind of commodities would we expect to go by air rather than ships? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think newspapers would now be printed in different locations, but food, you're perfectly uh, right. We are exporting some fresh fish to the sushi restaurants of Japan, and aviation is the only alternative there. The same goes if we, uh, if you found some roses uh, in town with a fair trade stamp on it, it usually comes from from Tanzania or some other African countries. And of course, we need aviation to import those. Otherwise, they will not look very nice. Uh, but 90-95% <coughs> of what we get from Asia to Europe is transported by sea. How long do you think it takes to send something from China to Rotterdam in Europe by sea? Three weeks, not a bad guess. It's a pretty fast vessel. <laughs> so I would say the typical thing is four to five weeks going through the Suez Canal. Okay, now the second question here is which policy areas should politicians focus on related to maritime transport? That's a, that's, that's a tricky one. Should politicians pay attention to maritime transport at all? A good idea, or <laughs> our topic for the for the essay is piracy, okay, in maritime transport, and uh, because of that, yeah, uh, piracy has been focused uh, quite a bit. It's not about pirates of the Caribbean, is it? Yeah. No, it's actually still happening in quite a lot of uh, of areas of the world, uh, but uh, it has certainly been on the political agenda uh, internationally. What other issues related to maritime transport do you think politicians do care about or should care about? Yeah, the environmental aspects, CO2 emissions, right. tr road transport and versus... Sea and the competition, transport. yes, definitely. Um, that's uh, a major issue and has been a major issue for the political regulations as we, we uh, shall see later on. So environment, piracy, anything else? Uh, I don't know how many of you who live close to a port where you come from, but if you were living close to a port or visiting a port um, 10, 15, oh, 10, 12 years ago, you would see a change in all the ports of the world almost. Even the small port of Molde had a change. There were fences coming up. If you were visiting the small port of Molde 12, 13 years ago, you could go freely out on, on uh, the apron. Now you can pass through most of the time, but uh, there are fences and gates. 
you know where this comes from? Yes? Yeah, it's much more secured after running. Exactly. Something called the ISPS code, uh, which uh, came after the terrorist attacks in New York, and uh, which is basically um, a requirement that vessels that uh, would eventually uh, go to American ports, they, they will have to only visit ports which has a strict access control to the vessels. So this happened even in the small port of Molda. And uh, the most funny part of this I've seen is in the port of the even smaller town of Ondalsnes, down in the fjord here. You can see next time you go there, there where, where the train stops, you can see a small, I think it's a 14, 15 foot uh, boat hanging on a wall. And this is part of the security regime out there. Looks like a rowing boat. It's, it's got an engine. But All right. Uh, I think maybe you've seen this slide. Possibly uh, Professor Broughton used it. But these are some of the mega trends uh, behind international supply chains, which very much affect the international maritime operations as well. We've seen this trend of globalization of consumption and production structures. We talk very much about globalization in general. But what do we mean by globalization of consumption and production structures? It's a word that we use quite a lot, but maybe we don't think very much about what it really means. What does the, cons the, the globalization of consumption patterns mean? Give it a try. No? Consum you are consumers when you buy things. How is your behavior different to the students 15 years or maybe 25 years ago? The kind of products you buy, where would they come from? All around the world. Now they come from all around the world. 25 years ago, you would find much more local products. We even used to have in the small town of Molde a lot of manufacturers of, of men's suits and things like that. It's nothing like that left. Everything is now imported. So we consume products from all over the world. Uh, production facilities are pretty much focusing on global markets. They export their products all over the world. This is what we mean by globalization of consumption and production structures. We've seen uh, a trend towards deregulated transport systems. What kind of regulations have we gotten rid of? What kind of ways could governments regulate transport? There are still some regulations left, but quite a lot of them have gone over the last decades. We had uh, a system in Norway and most other countries which reserved the inland transport for national operators some years ago. Now it's almost a free market for anyone to do transports within different countries. But there are still regulations left, as we shall see. Enhanced productivity in international supply chains very much focus on uh, uh, productivity and cost savings, uh, which also affects the way um, shipping is organized. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of structural changes, which means that, uh, for instance, as I said, in the container business, we now have operators that offer global services. And this is linked to the globalization of production structures. Um, a big manufacturer of goods now requires a transport service which could offer them transport from anywhere to anywhere. And this has meant that uh, we've also seen a lot of consolidation on the supply side, meaning that we need bigger units. And then the overall big mega trend is that we have had a, a huge increase in transport volumes over the years, especially when it comes to containerization. And this follows from the increasing 
uh, world trade volumes, but not only the volumes, also distances has grown. And it's the mix of volume and distance which we can measure in ton miles or ton kilometers that is actually increasing the market for shipping. So it's not only the volumes, it's also the distances that has grown. Where we used to, in Norway for instance, buy some products from Europe, now we may buy them from, from Asia instead, and that's a much longer transport distance. Okay, I'm not giving in, trying to, to keep you awake. <coughs> it's a hard task early in the morning. Now, take a, a sheet of paper, and spend three minutes, five minutes maybe, identify ship categories, ship types. Okay? Get going, and then I will ask you afterwards. Names of ship types. Try without Google first, okay? <laughs> Google is great, but it doesn't keep you awake, okay? Ship types is quite closely linked to cargo types, of course, so you may think about it in terms of what kind of cargo do we transport, what kind of ships do we need for those cargoes. Okay, should we... Start the brainstorming. Okay, I found, I don't know names now. Green sweater, green hoodie. First ship type, please. <laughs> please? Military, yeah. Naval ships, we call them. Very good. Please. Row, row. What does row, row mean? Roll on, roll off. Roll on, roll off. Which means that what kind of cargo could they carry? Vehicles. So this is. Roll on, roll off. We have a variant of it called Ropaxis. Anyone working in the aviation industry? What does Pax mean? Passengers. 
Okay. So uh, that's a combined vehicle and passenger type of vessel. The type of ferries that go from Oslo to Kiel in Germany, for instance, is a row packs. Um, <coughs> right, many more. On the back bench. Container ships. Okay, these we could um, divide into geared and uh, gearless. That means whether they have their own handling equipment or not. If it's geared, it has got cranes which means that it could visit any, visit any port. If it's gearless, it means that it's uh, reliant upon container cranes in the port, which means it can only visit the bigger ports who have their own container handling equipment. So geared means with cranes, gearless without cranes. Typically, smaller container vessels used along the coast here, for instance, would be geared because they are visiting small ports without their own handling equipment. The bigger container vessels going from Asia to Europe, for instance, are definitely gearless and reliant upon uh, cranes on the, on the port side. Okay, more? Offshore. Offshore. This is very much the business of this region, producing offshore service vessels of different kinds. Um, Whereas quite a lot of the European shipbuilding industry has uh, gone away over the last decades. This is one of the remaining uh, activities and you'll find quite a number of shipyards in this region producing vessels which are meant for the oil and gas activities, either for the exploration phase or for the production phase. Could be subdivided into many different categories, but let's keep it like this for now. Uh, so one, uh, the, the biggest vessels, which are those? Cruise? Sorry. Cruises, like uh, the one taking passengers to go to America. Oh, cruise, yeah, sorry. Um, my mistake. Cruise vessels, yeah. Of course, passenger vessels, yes, they are definitely getting bigger, but really big, slow moving ones. Tankers, yeah. In uh, part of the literature, this will be referred to as wet bulk. Uh, and we have many different categories of tankers as well. Uh, we can have, um, um, well, something that's, there's a lot of slang in shipping. So some we call dirty and some we call clean, but the proper names are crude tankers, which is uh, transporting the, the unprocessed oil from the oil fields to the refineries. Uh, that's it's not a it's particularly dirty business as such, but it's referred to as dirty. And then uh, we have the product tankers. And it's not particularly clean either, but uh, it's called clean in this some of the reports that you may find in the shipping newspapers. Uh, they are then uh, transporting the refined products like gasoline or, or other uh, things that you could refine from crude oil. And then we have a, c a category which we can call chemical tankers, which can transport a lot of different uh, substances, floating ones of course, but anything from mm, hazardous materials, dangerous acids, 
to food products. They also transport, if you buy orange juice in this local store, you, that is most probably transported by a tanker at some stage. Uh, sometimes in concentrated form, you can see from concentrate or not from concentrate on the, the pack. If it's from concentrate, it means that part of the water has been removed before transporting and then added again later in the process. Um, <coughs> these are basically two types, stainless steel and what we call coated tankers. Stainless steel ones are the most expensive ones but they can be used for any kind of substance. The coated ones are cheaper, but couldn't have the most corrosive or strongest acid. Okay, there's one, at least one major category that I want to have on the blackboard. Since we're talking about wet bulk, what would the other part of the bulk business be? Dry bulk. Dry bulk. And it's quite often just to refer to as bulk. Because we call if you talk about tankers and bulkers, this is what we mean really. But so it's not quite consistent the way it's used. And they are uh, transporting quite a variety of products, ores like iron ore, things that you can get out of a quarry. Uh, um, you could have uh, them transporting grain, so it's both food product and industrial products. Could be intermediate industrial products like uh, uh, alumina and a lot of other products. Okay, I think we've covered the most important ones. In our focus here, we are sort of disregarding the passenger side. So. We're also disregarding the, the naval side. Uh, so we're talking about the world merchant fleet and focusing on anything that could carry cargo. And I think we have covered the most important ones when we talk about the Roros, the container vessels, offshore, not so much, but a little bit. Uh, and the tankers and the dry bulkers. These are the four main categories that we'll focus on. Okay, here is a more slightly more systematic one, which is similar to the ones th that you can find in the chapter from Stopford. Slightly different um, categorization here because you ha you can see a term called liners. Um, a liner operation is actually opposite to a tramp operation. A liner operation is a scheduled service, something that is leaving every day, every week, every month on a fixed schedule. That's a liner operation calling in specific ports. So it's more like a bus route, if you, s uh, you can compare it to that, uh, but at uh, an international scale. And the typical ships that operate as liners with a fixed schedule would be container vessels, row-row vessels. And since we have row-row, we also have low-low, lift-on, lift-off, meaning that you cannot roll things onto the deck, but you have to use a crane uh, or a truck and a side port with for pallets, for instance. And then the combined row-row and packs vessels. You can see the dry bulkers here, different sizes of them. Tankers, also different sizes. DWT means dead weight tonnage. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then a lot of specialized uh, vessels. Okay. Since you will see a reference to the size of the vessels, I, I've added this one slide just defining uh, the most used ways of measuring a vessel. And it's a bit different from vessel type to vessel type. Um, 
the most used one may be the deadweight tonnage, which is a proxy, uh, an approximate number of the carrying capacity of the vessel, how much it can carry. But you should really deduct the weight of the fuel and some other things, but it's an approximate measure of how much it can carry. Sometimes you will see gross tonnage, uh, and that's most important if you want to calculate how much a vessel has to pay in port dues, canal dues, all these uh, taxes that they have to pay is usually related to the gross tonnage of the vessel. Uh, and it's actually not the tonnage at all, it's a volume. So it's quite misleading, the term. Um, it's actually about the cubic meters of all closed spaces of the vessel. Then we have, I'll drop the net tonnage, not much used. The TU is related to container vessels. You know what TEU stands for by now, I guess? Have you heard about TEUs? 20 foot equivalency units. So it means if you have a 40 foot container, it's two TEUs. So this is the number of 20 foot containers that can fit into a vessel. That's the typical way of measuring a container vessel. If you're talking about gas carriers, it's cubic meters. Roro ships, it's lane meters. The decks in a roro ship will be divided into a number of lanes. And if each lane here is uh, 50 meters and you have three of those, then that would be 150 lane meters uh, on the deck. So if you know that the trailer, truck trailer combination takes um, 18, 19 meters, for instance, you can divide the number of lane meters on the vessel to find out how many trucks it can carry. Yeah, displacement I think will drop that. Okay, before we break, um, just to illustrate a very typical trend in shipping is that we have had growing ship sizes. And container vessels is the most prominent example of that, where we have had a development towards bigger vessels in all markets, but we divide the shipping markets into short sea and deep sea and coastal trade. The short sea would be within the continent, like uh, Norway to somewhere in Europe. Um, the deep sea would then be from uh, Europe to Asia or to Africa or to South America. Uh, so, along the coast and on the short sea, we have rather small vessels between two and 700 TEUs, typical ones, going along the coast here, collecting cargo, going to Europe or to UK. And then the deep sea ones, they have grown quite a bit. Um, let's uh, focus on the latter development here. The Panamax, what could that mean? Four and a half thousand container units. Can you guess what the Panamax would be? What does it sound like, the word? The of the through the Panama Canal, which is very important, of course, between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, this is the biggest container vessels that could go through there. They are called Panamaxes. Then we had something we call post-Panamax, but now we're talking about super post-Panamax, mega carriers, even ultra-large container vessels, ULCVs, bigger than 10,000 units. And here, every year I give this presentation, I have to revise this bit because they are, keep, they are growing. On the last slide, a year ago, uh, well, it should say 2014 because I corrected that one, but not this one. Last year, this measure was 14,000. So the maximum ship size has increased to 18,000 over the last year, uh, having this new, uh, the first one where the, the Maersk, the big Danish operator, uh, which is the biggest container operator of the world, who released something called the Triple E class. Triple E means economies of scale, energy efficiency, and environmentally improved vessel. Okay, and then new Panamax, 2016, 
The Panama Canal, as some of you may know, is being expanded at the moment. So uh, in 2016, it has been postponed, these deadlines. So I don't know if it will happen in 2016, but that's the plan. Uh, then it will be able to accommodate 12,000. But still, the biggest vessels will not be able to pass through there, even with the expansion. All right, time for a break.